You're listening to The Mentors. This is Vadim. And this is Sergey. And we are twin brother extraordinaires. <laughs> what are what? we? What are we extraordinary? What do you mean? What is the? What is the extraordinary piece about Vadim? I don't know. Well, we're not ordinary. First of all, we're weird. Second of all, you're weird. No one's ordinary. Did you hear that? That was the sound of a pin dropping and people turning off their radios. <laughs> <laughs> this is not being broadcast to radio, Vadim. This is not 1975. No, radios are still around. Uh, actually, more people listen to radio than podcasts. So uh, sorry if we're not reaching you out there, radio folk. No, but this is fine. We we became podcast just for a reason so that the FCC could just let us be. Um FCC so, won't let us be and let us be me, so let me see. That's just, that's completely the wrong lyrics. And if you are a fan of Eminem, uh, you're going to hate us. <laughs> uh, well, I was just trying to rap for myself, Vadim, trying to establish my rap career. But I'm failing. You are. It's okay. Uh, you don't have to be a good rapper, too. You just have to be a good podcaster. That's all I care about, certainly. And that's what our audience cares about. But today... Today we decided to rebroadcast one of our original episodes, it was episode 11, How to Network Like a Pickup Artist. Now I know, the title, I guess maybe we want, it was a little bit clickbaity in the beginning, we, we wanted people to, we wanted to shock, shock and on, so it might turn some of you off, but we assure you, we assure you that there's value in this episode. Okay, why did we decide to talk about networking right now and rebroadcast this old episode? Well, it's September. It's the start of a new school season. People are coming back from vacation and they're ready to crush it, take on new opportunities, maybe change jobs or start that new business or progress somehow in a way that in the summer, a lot of people take time off and sort of stop progressing. And one of the best ways that we found to make big leaps in your career is to actually build relationships with people. And on Sunday, we talked about how Vadim got the opportunity to become a lecturer, which led to an opportunity to become a professor. And the way that he actually first got the opportunity to teach in the first place when he was 30 years old was that I happened to go to an event that the nonprofit I was working at was hosting. This guy approached me. We talked for like maybe five, 10 minutes. And then months later, he sent me a LinkedIn message asking if I know anybody who could uh, teach entrepreneurship at this university upstate. So just showing up to that event created this opportunity I could have not otherwise foreseen. And we're big on showing up and we want to help you figure out how to get the most out of events when you actually do decide to get off your bum and go show up somewhere and make relationships there. And actually, when I was just entering tech and got my first opportunity as a sales leader, that happened because I actually found a gentleman that was running a startup that was going through the Mass Challenge Accelerator program, and I went to an event where he was tabling, and I made it a point to talk to him and tell him how I've been doing SMB sales, small to medium-sized business sales, for about a year at that point, and how I could specifically help him get his business off the ground. So a lot of the best opportunities we've ever gotten in career transitions that happened for us have been because of the people that we were able to meet. And so this is incredibly important to do, even if you're not that comfortable with it, it's a skill that you need to build in order, If I mean, if you want to skip levels and progress in a way that maybe you weren't able to before. The nice thing is this episode is going to make it actually very easy for you to already get much better at networking than you already are through some easy tips that we're going to share that hopefully are helpful to you. Now, some people also love to hear resources, uh, like books, for example, that might help with something like this. Back in the day, one book that Sergey and I read that really helped transform the way that we thought about networking and building relationships was Keith Ferrazzi's Never Eat Alone. He gives really great tactical advice about how to make sure that you're meeting the right people, how to follow up, how to stay top of mind, how to separate yourself from the other people that they're meeting. And so if you're looking for a book to read about this topic, check out Never Eat Alone by Keith Ferrazzi. There is also a great book called The Pickup Artist by Neil Strauss, who used to be a New York Times journalist, and now he's a podcaster and an author. Good book. Uh, You know, there are some takeaways out there, even if you're not looking to just get better at meeting people of the opposite sex. And we do apply some things that we learned from reading books like that and reading books on networking to this episode. All right. So without any further delay, even though we already delayed by five and a half minutes, here is our episode called How to Network Like a Pickup Artist. Enjoy. Hey 
The Mentor. Okay. This is not a music show, Sergey. Let's start the podcast. All right, all right, all right. How's everybody doing today? This is Sergey and Vadim. Well, I'm technically I'm Sergey. Okay, fine. This is Vadim and Sergey of the mentors. the mentors, and this is a show where we provide insights into how entrepreneurs and creators get their ventures off the ground to help them overcome the obstacles faced in the critical early days. Now, today we're going to talk about a really important topic here in, in an accent that is <laughs> undecipherable. Uh, we are going to talk, if you read the title of this episode, we're going to be talking about how to network like a pickup artist. Now, Important disclaimer, mm-hmm. Vadim and I are not pickup artists, or at and least... And not to say that we don't have luck with the ladies. Well, you know, yeah, I mean, I'm in, a, I'm in a long-term relationship, very happy about it. Sergey. Thanks for rubbing it in. <laughs> but um, pickup artist principles, and if you've heard of pickup artistry, uh, there's a book called The Pickup Artist by Neil Strauss. He has been interviewed, I think he's been on Tim Ferriss' show. Probably. Among others, he was a New York Times reporter before uh, jumping into the pickup artistry game. But the reason why we're actually talking about this topic, it has very little to do with uh, romantic relationships, but more so how can we apply the principles that pickup artists use to meet very attractive people to be able to to meet people that are sought after, to be able to network effectively because they're actually very applicable. The whole point of pickup artistry uh, is to break down basically the rules of communication in society, right? Um, For example, in different countries, it might be a little bit different for the rules of dating and the rules of business. But in America, things are done a certain way. Men and women um, communicate in a certain way. And even in business relationships, you have to communicate in a certain way. So uh, while it might seem kind of sleazy, the whole, the fact that there's a whole discipline um, committed to this specifically, it's actually pretty straightforward and beneficial because it just breaks down how humans can communicate together. And I think that's a valuable thing that we can all learn from. It's What it really is, is a science and an analysis, I should say, of human psychology and how humans communicate with each other, in particular strangers. It's very important as a business owner or an aspiring entrepreneur or someone that's trying to develop their network and break into entrepreneurship. It's important to be able to build relationships with people that you don't know. And it's not natural for many people. And that's why we want to talk about this topic. So let's jump right into it. Yeah, so Um, first and foremost, this can be practiced. Uh, If you think that you're reclusive or hermit or um, introverted and you think this is just not naturally part of my DNA, think again. Uh, We're humans and humans are social creatures and this is something that can be learned if it's practice. But the first step, of course, is being willing to get better at it. Um, We're going to talk about a few principles that we have applied from pickup artists, pickup artistry, I suppose, uh, in the business world. And uh, and a few things that we came up with of our own along the way. And I think a few stories that that you'll find interesting of how others that we know have applied it, whether they know it or not. Um, So first, people uh, always ask us, how do you get past that initial mental block of, okay, I need to approach somebody, whether that's somebody at a networking event or a man or a woman at a bar or just somebody that you want to strike up a conversation with. And this is actually a really useful skill because uh, when you meet people, when you're open to being vulnerable, when you're open to getting in front of somebody and maybe stumbling along the way and maybe saying something that's not perfect, uh, then you open yourself up to building relationships with people and that can have a really long-term effect or long-lasting effect, I should say. You know, when you're meeting people in person, when you're building a true connection, you never know how that's going to pay dividends in the future. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is what I call the three second rule of not giving a fuck. <laughs> Pardon my French, but it just. Uh, uh, Don't swear, Vadim. Sorry. We have children that listen to remember babies. You're not my mother. I... Uh, sorry, mom. Actually, if you're listening to this, um, well, we swear all the time, so sorry. Sorry, mom. Uh, this is how it works in the business world, but uh, we could find the three second rule of not giving a hoot. 
A hoot. Is that better? A That's hoot. better. I like it. Okay. Uh, well, so uh, I should say Vadim is uh, disclaimer, ladies, eligible bachelor. He is yes, single is. right now. Uh, I think you came up with this rule for yourself. I did. Uh, to get rid of some of the nerves associated with approaching uh, people, I should say, of the female variety in New York City. Yeah. Um, but I've actually used this rule for myself in networking events when I want to make sure that I'm using my time effectively and speaking to as many people as possible. What is the three-second rule of a team? Well, first of all, uh, I should just add that the reason why this is so analogous to a networking event is because for a man, approaching a woman a lot of times, or an attractive woman, but really any woman, you build just you build it up in your head as if it's this crazy thing that you have to do. And same thing in a networking event. If there's somebody important that you want to come up to, again, you might think, oh, why would they want to talk to me? They're important. And so that's why there's so much um, overlap there. But the three-second rule is pretty straightforward. Basically, uh, it breaks it down to three seconds to actually get in to talk to somebody. Rule number one, second number one, make eye contact, right? Make eye contact with a person uh, so that you don't just uh, come up to them randomly and start talking without developing some kind of social interaction. So second one, in the first second, you should make eye contact. In the second second, you should make the approach. And in the third second, you need to start the conversation. Now, it's pretty straightforward, and you might think, uh, okay, that's really dumb. Obviously, I can do this. But um, by taking it and breaking it down into three seconds and by giving yourself only three seconds to do something like this, you're taking away all of the uh, hyping yourself up and the decision-making that our brains like to go through before coming up to somebody, let's say, or doing something risky like uh, making yourself vulnerable, putting yourself out there and talking to somebody. And, you know, the natural the question that comes after this is, okay, fine, let's say I got past the mental barrier and I just go up and talk to somebody, right? Because that's the whole point of this is just don't overthink it. Just get up there, make eye contact first, hopefully, and just start talking to somebody without spending too much time thinking of what am I going to say. Uh, so then what do you say when you come to somebody? Well, if you're really worried about that, I suggest just say hello. Come up to somebody and say, hey, how are you? Or, hey, what brings you to this event? Or, hey, are you from the area? You know, really bland, easy, straightforward things that you literally don't have to think about for more than three seconds to say. The the beauty of this rule and the reason why the th- three seconds in particular is so important is actually the more you do it, the more you condition your brain to just act it, after a certain cutoff point, uh, you... You basically tell yourself, if you tell yourself that no matter what, within those three seconds, I'm going to approach that person. In the beginning, that's really hard and you it'll take you more than three seconds. You'll be agonizing over it. But the more you do it and actually just start walking toward a person and opening them up, or in other words, that's pick up an artist, artist mm-hmm. speak, open up someone. But really just saying something to them within that short period of time, the more comfortable next time you'll be with just seeing a stranger. Once you make eye contact, your brain will already know that it's okay to start talking to them. And in particular, in, in, in bars, there's some, <laughs> I think, implicit, it's just implicitly a social setting where you can approach someone. But networking events are even better for that. When you're at a networking event, when you're at a conference, when you're at a meetup, People are there to meet other people, so it's actually not awkward. It's already implied that it's not awkward to come up to someone uh, if they are there, right? Just by virtue of them being there. In fact, even if there's a group of people standing together talking and you make eye contact with somebody, you can just come up and say, oh, hey, uh, don't want to be just standing around here awkwardly. How you doing? Uh, What are you guys talking about? Sounds really interesting, right? So you can even make a little joke about it. But maybe you overheard them say something and you could say, I'm not eavesdropping, but uh, I love cryptocurrency and everybody's talking about it right now. How can I uh, join this conversation, right? The dynamic between men and women is such that it's expected that the man will come up to a woman. But at a networking event, there's no such expectation. So if you're a woman, you can come up to a man and vice versa or a man to man, woman to woman, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but you're actually doing somebody a favor by starting the conversation because guess what? That person is probably hyped up as well and doesn't necessarily want to go through the pain of initiating the conversation. I want to tell a quick story about how someone I know actually applied this rule. I don't think she knew she was applying it when she did it, but it, it, it had a really cool result for her. So she had been uh, researching the organization that I've been working with the last couple of years, National Nonprofit Venture for America, really cool org that helps uh, spur entrepreneurship in emerging America. 
American cities through a two-year fellowship. And she had read the book that our CEO wrote. She knew who he was, Andrew Yang. And she uh, she had applied to a job at VFA and never heard back. And she happened to be uh, actually a few blocks away from the office at a uh, like a fast casual restaurant there, sitting and just eating. Uh, and she saw the CEO of Venture for America very serendipitously in line waiting to get food alone. Uh, Andrew was waiting in line. And at this point, all these thoughts started going through her head. She, you know, she to her, to her this guy is almost like a celebrity uh, because he owns this, he runs this really cool nonprofit. Uh, she has never talked to him before. She'd never heard about the job. She started thinking about what am I wearing? It, it, do I look good enough to even approach uh, approach this person? And then she just said, you know what? This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. When am I ever going to see this person in the same restaurant again? And almost without hesitation, I think there was a little hesitation, but she overcame it. Uh, Natalie came up to Andrew and just said, hey, Andrew, uh, it's so funny seeing you here. I love what you're doing with VFA. I actually had applied to a job and you know, I'm really excited for the potential of possibly talking to you guys. Now, little did she know that Andrew loves uh, things like this. He loves it when someone just takes a chance and approaches him or does takes a chance in any way. And so he actually said, oh, Natalie, you seem like a very interesting person. Let me take you to the office. It's just a block and a half away. And he ended up taking her to the office. Right then and there? Right then and there, wow. on the spot. Took her to the office. Uh, he, uh, The woman that was hiring for a role, one of the roles in the organization, uh, was right there. And he said, hey, listen, Kathleen, why don't you meet with Natalie? I just met her in the, in, in the restaurant. She seems like a really interesting person. Maybe you can tell her a little bit about what we do here. And uh, a few weeks later, Natalie had a job. And I've been working with her for, I think, over a year now. So... This is the kind of stuff that could happen when you bite the bullet and get good at uh, just approaching someone and talking to them, even if you don't know them. You know, getting past that mental barrier and finally maybe having the epiphany that it doesn't matter what's the worst that can happen. That's what she thought of in that moment. What's the worst that can happen? I think that's a really, really powerful statement because when you can get to that place in your mind... Uh, the, the the world's the limit, right? Sky's the limit? Sky's the limit. I need to learn my uh, American idioms. But, <laughs> the world's the limit. <laughs> but um, the reason why this three-second rule of not giving a hoot works if you continue to practice it, there's actually a couple of reasons. First of all, as you do it more and more, you realize one very, very important thing, uh, and this has to do with kind of human psychology and just humans in general. No one gives a hoot about anyone else but themselves. So if you come up to somebody and you accidentally say something awkward, maybe in that moment they'll laugh to themselves, but probably within 10 minutes uh, of uh, the conversation ending or them leaving the event, they'll completely forget about it. So first of all, nobody really cares about what you say or how you say it. They're thinking about themselves and what they are going to say. Uh, and everybody's living in their own heads, in their own little worlds, and they're a lot more concerned about themselves. The second thing is, once you start doing this more often, and this this will work even if you're generally uncomfortable with approaching people. Once you start doing it more often, you get desensitized to the fear of talking to new people because you realize rejection isn't as bad as you thought it would be. It's actually kind of good because once somebody loses their interest or decides not to talk to you, whether, again, you're trying to pick up a woman or a man or you're trying to talk to somebody at an event, you can go and talk to somebody else. There's, There's other, people. other people there. There's always going to be somebody else that you can uh, start a conversation with and maybe it'll be a lot better than you could even imagine. So you realize that the risk of one conversation going bad is really not a risk at all. It's not a risk because the worst that can happen is is literally nothing. <laughs> uh, so okay, And so nothing would have happened anyways if you didn't try in the first place. Uh, but how can you get more comfortable with approaching someone that you don't know and just starting to talk to them. One thing that works really well is to actually practice ahead of time what is going to come out of your mouth, what you're going to say uh, if you meet someone randomly that you don't know. Um, so you can obviously have many, there are multiple things you can say. Once you get good at it, by the way, things will just come to you. But, uh, but the best way is to actually practice the five second introduction or the five second opener that you will have. And then all of a sudden, the more you practice, then you have an arsenal of openers uh, or ways to start a conversation. Sometimes at a networking event, when there's a few people uh, talking to each other, I'll make it a point to 
using Vadim's three second rule, make eye, eye contact with somebody and I'll come up to them and I'll just mention like a word or a topic, the last topic that I, they were just talking about. Uh, or I'll even say, what brings you to this event? Uh, were you just interested in the topic or are you looking to meet certain type of people? You Sometimes know. I'll come up and if there's two people talking to each other, I'll wait for a moment. First of all, I'll hang out a little bit, but that gets too awkward. You don't want to wait too long. But I'll wait for a slight moment, maybe in a lull in conversation. I'll be like, hey, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to interrupt you guys. I just felt awkward standing there. Or just make yeah, a joke, yeah. you know, make a fool of yourself, kind of neg yourself a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it'll um, kind of take away some of the tension that may have been there in the first place. They'll have a laugh and then they'll naturally ask you, yeah, what are you doing here? Where are you from? Or whatever. It's yeah. very, very straightforward. Well, what, once I've even, uh, I think I, I was standing next to where the where the bartender was serving beers. If you're in New York City, benefit of going to networking events is you can drink every day of the week. It's a great place For to free, be an alcoholic. By the way. <laughs> oh, uh, great place. Uh, but some people have a problem with it. Sometimes you see the same people at networking events day in, day out. I think for the free food and booze. Regardless, I was at this event waiting for the beer, uh, in line for the beer, and I, I just told the person next to me, like, hey, this place has actually a pretty cool beer selection for, for an event. And that was the first thing that I said to them. Hmm. I just looked at something. It was a beer that was in front of me, and that gave me an idea, gave me an idea of something to say to that person. Not, it was not anything like, what do you do? Yeah. <laughs> it could be. You could say that. But uh, it was a more organic way to start a conversation. And then, and then they asked me, why, why are you here? Visual cues are huge. You know, maybe somebody's wearing something nice. Maybe they have a T-shirt on that says something cool on it. Maybe uh, you heard something in the conversation, something about a local sports team, and you're behind it. So those are that would be an auditory cue. But you know, look out for cues. Don't think about oh, what am I going to say ahead of time. Just take what's in the moment and comment on it. So two things. First of all, uh, comment on whatever you see. And second of all, you can have a practiced thing that you come with uh, for how you introduce yourself, as Sergey said. Get in front of a mirror before you go to a networking event and practice your 10, 15, 20 second elevator pitch about yourself and or your company or whatever it is you're trying to represent ahead of time. Yeah. Get comfortable with it. It's okay. Other people are doing it too, by the way. They just don't yeah. talk about it. So that's those, those are uh, sort of two parts of the, of the same point, which is practice your opener, but then also practice talking about yourself so that you're using the right words to describe yourself that are interesting, impressive, that can get conversation going and not telling your entire life story. Nobody needs to hear that. They just want the highlight reel. So practice your own highlight reel. But Sergey, let's say I'm going into a meeting, uh, a business meeting, and I'm okay. I'm one person and there's two or three other people there. And how do I make sure that it's not awkward? What else can I say as an opener in that scenario? I mean, what I've done in the past, it, you will hopefully know at least one of the people that you're meeting with, and I'll do some research. I'll go on their LinkedIn, see where they're from, where they went to school, what companies they work for, if they've had a career change. And you know, in one example, I would say uh, if I'm talking, let's say, to a, a an IT person at a company, I'm meeting with a CIO type or somebody who's like a VP of technology to do an integration with them, right? I mean, that's this is a very specific kind of example, but I'm trying to build rapport with that individual. I'm never met them before and I saw on their LinkedIn that they actually before getting IT into IT they used to do sales then I would ask them like I would say hey it looks like you sounds like you've been here for a few years how did you decide to get into IT what made you do it people love it when you're asking them personal questions like that because they love to tell their own stories and I just had to do a little bit of research and by the way this if there's three people in the room that opens up the a conversation and a way for everyone to introduce why they are here what they love about the company and uh, sort of get to know each other a little bit. Yeah, and you don't have to just do this before a meeting, by the way. A lot of times, if you're going to a networking event or any kind of event or conference, you can create a list of target people that you want to approach and meet, and you could do research about them ahead of time as well. I mean, that's okay. Better to come prepared. Now, I wouldn't suggest doing research about girls that are going to bars that you're going to then <laughs> go to because that's, that's called stalking. That's creepy. Don't do that. Don't do that. Um, but for networking events, for um, potential business opportunities, Opportunities, it's totally acceptable. And again, it's better to over-prepare than, than not to be prepared at all. The other kind of rule of thumb to follow if you're uh, going to be, let's say, at a networking event is, again, it, go, it, it ties to the fact that other people don't necessarily want to start conversations. Um, but another rule of thumb is 
talk to the older people in the crowd. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a lot of times you'll notice that they're standing there and no one's talking to them because maybe the general uh, average uh, crowd is younger. But a lot of times the oldest people are the most interesting and the most accomplished people there. Most accomplished, have most experience, have the biggest networks, don't have people talking to them. It's like the pickup artists like to say, if you, if you read... Uh, if you read the pickup artist, the book, uh, or any, if you just follow the principles, they like to say, approach the most attractive person in the room. Because oftentimes what happens is people are just ogling at them, but not actually talking to them and treating them like a human being. You know, if someone, if you're attractive and someone comes up to you and tells you, you, you look so beautiful or you look so handsome, uh, they hear it all the time. They're not going to be impressed by that. But if you approach them, and by the way, most people won't even approach them to say that. But if you approach them and again, make an observation about what's going on in the bar, say, you say there's a basketball game on, say, and she, and she's looking at it, oh man, the supersonics, uh, don't know anything about basketball, but do, can you teach me something about, you know, so um, just just as an example, talk to the most attractive person in the room. Same with networking events. Talk to some of the older people in the room. Talk to the person that just gave a talk, right? I mean, of course, in, in the scenario of a, of a networking event where there's a panel or, or there was a speaker, everybody's going to hound that person afterwards. So you either make sure you're the first one there, run up to them right after they're done talking without being creepy, or wait till uh, a few people already talked to them and walked away or catch them on the way out. But I'll, I have a quick story about how uh, uh, someone that I know has done this very successfully. Uh, again, Andrew of Venture for America, uh, he, uh, when he was first starting out, it was important for a nonprofit to be able to get good donors. And he had written a book called Smart People Should Build Things. And great book, by the way. Great book. Check it out uh, about entrepreneurship. And um, and so what he would do is he would go to networking events where uh, there are people that he th- he would think would be really good to meet for the nonprofit. And uh, and then he would essentially wait for them to be done speaking and be one of the first ones to come up to them and give them a, a personalized signed copy of his book with a note to them. He did this with the CEO of Quicken Loans, founder and CEO, Dan Gilbert. Uh, and Dan was really impressed by what Andrew was doing and ended up being a big supporter and donor for Venture for America. So you can be actually very proactive about approaching people in an, in an event that are very sought after just have a way to do it think of it ahead of time how you're going to do it so you don't chicken out in the last minute this is generally good to practice because uh life is all about relationships uh, i think and meeting new people and so if you're not very comfortable with that process generally get comfortable with it because it's going to add a lot of value and happiness to your life so start approaching people you know, start talking to people, be self-deprecating if you need to be, if that helps you, um, but do do it. Can I talk about one more concept? Vadim, what's peacocking? Because it's, it's some weird. people are familiar, but they but it's a funny word. What does peacocking mean and why should you do it? Not everybody should do it, but why? Sure. You, it's when you dress up as a peacock and start <laughs> accosting people in New York City. Uh, uh, no, <laughs> that works wonders. Yes, I've done it once um, in my own apartment. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Okay. Uh, peacocking is basically a practice where when you're going to some kind of social event where there's a lot of people, uh, you try to differentiate yourself and stand out by wearing something or having something on your person that looks a little bit different. So, for example, if you um, go to a bar, maybe you'll wear a velvet suit as opposed to just like a regular jacket. Or a top hat. That's or a top That's hat. pretty cool. Um, once or a mask on, on Halloween, I I went out and I wore cat ears because that's not something you typically see and not you don't see a man wear that on Halloween <laughs> you don't usually. Wear um, what what else can you do? Let's see. Uh, but what can you do? Let's well, say and what's appropriate in a networking event? Well, so <laughs> so t- to to apply it to to our to what our listeners are interested in hearing about, um, for example, Vadim and I we. We know that we're when we're at an event together, since we're twins and we both have beards, it kind of already makes us stand out. So oftentimes we'll actually walk around at the event together mm-hmm. because uh, sometimes people will even start talking to us because they can tell we look the same. So we don't even have to open people up, right, <laughs> to start conversations. So that's right. our version of peacocking, right? Two bearded twins. Um, hard to replicate. Hard to clone <laughs> yourself. <laughs> right. But, uh, but for Andrew at that event, right, it was the fact that he had a book. Uh, it was a prop, I suppose 
those, but also he is uh, this. He's actually a proven entrepreneur. So don't just carry around a random book that you sign. Uh, have have something that uh, is of value, and that's he had that. Um, maybe some other examples of peacocking uh, at a networking event. Anything else with him? That's probably fine. Let's not uh, make the whole world <laughs> dress up and wear costumes yeah. and go meet people. But um, there is a lot of value in getting out there, putting yourself out having there. Having a so cane? How about having, having a cane? Having a cane yeah. is fine. Um, people but just want to help you then. Get comfortable with the process. But most importantly, get yourself to enjoy it and be inquisitive. Yep. You know, uh, when you're talking to people, sure, in the beginning to get comfortable, you can ask some rehearsed sort of canned questions and things that you go through. But what you'll notice is... If it's somebody interesting that you're meeting, you're naturally going to be super curious about their life or their career or whatever it is. And if you're inquisitive and if it's genuine, people are going to love you. They're going to, uh, first of all, because if you read How to Win Friends and Influence People, you know that people like talking about themselves. And so if you're genuinely curious about them, they're going to walk away from the interaction thinking that you're awesome. Yeah. Uh, actually, Vadim talks about how I met friends and influence, how to meet friends and influence people. How I met a friend and he was my only <laughs> uh, friend forever. In an article that we're about to publish on, on Goalcast about the top three books that have changed Vadim's perspective. But um, so check it out, goalcast.com, uh, entrepreneurship section. Uh, but uh, another thing I want to mention that Vadim just talked about, which is uh, being inquisitive. Um, also listen to people. This seems obvious. I am guilty, guilty, guilty. of... Um, zoning out when people are talking because yeah. I'm either worried about what I want to say next or because they're really boring and I oh, don't care. Stop it. No, but I... True. I, no. true. The thing is, if you actually listen, instead of thinking what you're going to say next, um, you will think of more stuff to say because you'll you'll hear something that they mentioned that maybe you know a lot about and it'll help continue the conversation and uh, show that you care, which, which is what everybody's really craving right someone to care about them this is something you could do today so if you're listening to this jot down our email uh you can email me vadim v-a-d-i-m at thementors.co thementors.co and tell us your story about how you conquered your fear of talking to people or how you just decided to take the three second approach allow yourself to be vulnerable be vulnerable came up to somebody, started a conversation, and, and let us know how it, what it resulted in. And then, if you'd like, we can mention you in our next yeah. episode. And we'll yeah. put you, actually, we'll also add your uh, suggestion of how you might have done this or your story in our show notes for this episode. Let's do it. Let's yeah. let's crowdsource our podcast Let's episodes. do it. All right. <laughs> All right. right. It's yeah. The Mentor. Grab the guitar, Sergey. <laughs> Hopefully right. you guys found this helpful. Grab the guitar. Uh,